We move now to Dr. Robert Russell, the director for the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences and the Ian G. Barber Professor of Theology and Science in Residence at the Graduate Theolo Theological Union at Berkeley to talk about cosmology, philosophy, and theology in creative mutual interaction. Please uh, welcome Professor Russell. Well, it is, it, is, <clears throat> it is a great pleasure to be here today. Thank you for the introduction. Thanks for the committee for inviting me. Um, delighted to return to Santa Clara University on this wonderful occasion. Let me also offer this dedication of my talk to Ian G. Barber, uh, the pioneer of theology and science from the 60s forward, uh, who died Christmas Eve. We will all miss him. Rest in peace. Thank you. So my topic today is scientific cosmology, philosophy, and creation theology, creative mutual interactions. The interactions go, go in three ways. We'll look at two of them today. The unusual one is to see the role of philosophy and theology in the context of discovery, theory, construction, and science. We'll also see, in the third way, the context of interpretation. This is usually what you mean by theology and science. You look at the science and you think about it philosophically and then theologically. There's also a, a context of justification. We won't see it so much today, but sometime, if I can come back, I'll tell you the story of Fred Hoyle, who invented steady state precisely because of his, his atheism. Okay. So, background to modern science, the role of philosophy and theology in the formation of modern science. Modern science arose in the confluence of two major streams of Western intellectual history. The Greek Logos philosophy, which tells us the universe is rational, with the structure of the Logos, and the biblical creation ex nihilo tradition, which says the universe is contingent, the creation of a free and loving sovereign God. Rationality, in turn, leads to the notion that the universe is intelligible, can be discovered, the laws of nature can be discovered, and contingency leads to the notion that since God created it freely, the universe need not exist, nor need it exist the way it is. We need, we need to look for genuine knowledge only through experiment. We can't reason the way the universe is through Greek syllogism. And because it's God's creation and not divine, doing science is not sacrilegious. It may be unethical, but it isn't uh, violating the sacred. <laughs> now, these, the, the method that comes out of this is basically called uh, methodological naturalism. Scientific theories intentionally do not invoke God. They see how much we can explain about nature by s t taking events to be natural effects of natural causes. Doesn't mean God isn't working, but it does mean for science we don't respond that way. We don't raise the divine into our science. So, and on the one hand, methodological naturalism does not prove metaphysical naturalism. Jack and many people today spoke eloquently about the fact that our conflict isn't with science, but with scientism, atheism. Um, and that also stands against the claims of ID, which say because evolutionary biology doesn't refer to, to God, it can't be right, we've got to change it by introducing God called intelligent designer. So science does not equal atheism either. Uh, we're, we support science. We don't support scientism. My point is that those are philosophical and theological positions, <coughs> positions that shape science. So it, the practice of science presupposes these, whether or not a scientist knows that. The first step towards modern cosmology is Newtonian mechanics, the classical principle of relativity. Here, Newton and Galileo, of course, and Kepler and others, Copernicus, made their break with Aristotle. Um, absolute motion and rest is meaningless. All you have is a principle of relative motion. It's displayed through a series of equations, Newton's laws, and the notion of observable, uh, inertial observers. Interestingly, it requires a metaphysical concept, absolute space and absolute time. They are, affect the world. They make the world be the way it is. But they are unaffected by the world. And you can see the hint of deism in that framework. They provide what Newton called the divine sensorium. They are the way in which God senses the world. So even in Newton's equations, which you can study you know, in a first year physics class, you've already got a theological and philosophical penumbra shaping and forming it as a kind of background landscape. Newton's gravity, and the classical theory of gravity is based on Newton's principle of equivalence. All bodies, <clears throat> all bodies, unlike Aristotle, all bodies accelerate at the same rate. <clears throat> classical mechanics and classical gravity produced 
Newtonian cosmology. The world that we lived in in the 18th century was a universe infinite in size, static, and eternal. So it's both like Aristotle because it's static and eternal. It's unlike Aristotle because it's infinite in size. God's sovereignty or dominion determines the physical state of the universe. God's way of acting was to determine nature to be what it is. Now, there were reactions to this, of course, to the so-called mechanistic worldview. <clears throat> Deism, God made the world at the beginning and then abandoned it. Reductionism, determinism, and materialism. Um, and according to E.A. Burt in his famous quote, man, sick, becomes a puny, <clears throat> irrelevant spectator of a car cold, hard, colorless, and silent world. So this is the world in which much of Protestant theology in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries arose. And you can see Kant here in his notion that you can't appeal to science for God, you have to appeal to the sphere of moral ex uh, experience. Reactions in the 19th to 20th century to this science, here we're seeing science being interpreted theologically, not the philosophical assumptions underlying science. Religion reduced to mor was reduced to morality and personal piety. Um, think Friedrich Schleiermacher, it's a great example. God is limited <clears throat> to the subjective sphere of human existence. So this is a typical 19th century Protestant liberalism. A second reaction, of course, is atheism. You know, there are atheists going back to Socrates. Socrates denied the Homeric gods. He was, um, uh, of course, executed for that. But I mean modern atheism as a movement. Uh, Feuerbach, Nietzsche, Freud, Marx, Bertrand Russell. I put in small, smaller font. <laughs> the baby atheists, Monod, Dawkins, and Weinberg, who reinvent the wheel without knowing it and only get part of it right. <laughs> but Nietzsche, Feuerbach, Freud, Marx, and Russell, Bertrand Russell, do present significant challenges for us Christians and for Jews and, and Muslims. All I'm, going to be, all I'm emphasizing there is that modern atheism arose and was shaped by the culture of, of materialism, which was a philosophical interpretation of the science of Newton. By the way, Michael Buckley, distinguished Jesuit, has written a great book, At the Origins of Modern Atheism. We should all read that backwards 10 times. It's fantastic. Again, we're tracing <clears throat> the history of the influence of philosophy and behind that theology on the rise and evolution of science, in particular physics and cosmology. So Einstein's special relativity, 1905, so it's uh, two decades, two centuries since Newton. He used Newton's principle of relativity. He, he kept the same principle of motion, the one that distinguished modern science from Aristotle. Right? So he's on the modern science side. He keeps that same principle, but extends it beyond dynamics, you know, balls moving around, to electromagnetism. So that's Maxwell's world, Maxwell and Faraday and those guys. He chose the particular form of special relativity by a principle of aesthetics. Here's an extra scientific, in a sense, theory, of a criterion of theory choice. It's coming from aesthetics, right, into science, typically called Occam's razor. The best theory is the simplest theory. Why should that be? Why should nature be simple, right? And it's simple enough for us, for us to understand it. But it turns out that the simplest theory is Special relativity. The simplest way is to take into account electromagnetism and ma maintain the principle of relativity as a philosophical principle guiding theories construction is through Einstein's special relativity. There are more complicated ways to do it, but that's the simplest way. So the simplest theory proves to be the most fertile. And he did it by making the speed of light a universal constant and adopting the Lorentz transformations. See, when I would teach that, like at Carlton, I would teach special relativity, but it, I didn't see that I was teaching something that floats on this beautiful philosophical background about what nature's like, which itself floats on the theological tradition of ex nihilo and the Greek tradition of logos. Um, in 15 years later, Einstein extended uh, special relativity, which was electricity, magnetism, and Newton, to include gravity. Now, here he made a number of explicit philosophical assumptions which helped shape his theory. The principle of relativity, he already had that. The principle of equivalence, which he already had, now extended to, to a wider 
range the universe. Mach's principle. This is an unusual principle. It's worth just saying except for a second. Mach's principle says that uh, mass, the weight of this glass, is not an intrinsic property of the glass, like its position. It's the, it results out of the effect of the rest of the universe on the glass. So mass is, in fact, a byproduct of the rest of the universe on the object. Radically different concept of what it means to have mass than to say we have a certain property. <coughs> Einstein incorporated that to the notion of the curvature of space-time. He also assumed you could represent the universe as a manifold, a, a space, a geometry. We take that for granted, of course, but that wasn't taken for granted. For Newton, <clears throat> for Newton, the universe was an infinite empty container. For Einstein, the universe is space-time with matter shaping its curve, the curvature. Now, technically, he represents it through these equations. On the left, you see the curvature of space-time. On the right, the distribution of matter. When I taught this to Carlton, I taught that. But that's the result of what we just saw. So I confess the teaching of physics oftentimes treats physics as if it were distinguishable from philosophy and theology, and then that, that pervades the same mistake, right? It's a self-justifying mistake. But in fact, these equations are profound. It's the first time in Western intellectual history that the universe's shape is treated as a physical phenomenon that can be affected by mass. For, from Aristotle forward, except for Leibniz, space or space-time was a container. Here it's not a container. It's part of the, the reality, the physical reality. But you don't, may not see that if you just learn how to solve these very complicated equations. Or technically, there are 264 equations nested into this single expression. It takes about six months to learn how to solve it. Now, the nice way of saying this from Ms. Thorne and Wheeler, <clears throat> matter tells space how to curve, space tells matter how to move. So the heavy egg sitting on the rubber um, surface distorts the surface than the little tiny ants walking around going ellipses, not because gravity pulls them, as in Newton, empty space, force of gravity, you go in ellipse, but because for Einstein, the space itself is something. It's curved, and matter moves on the simplest possible path along the space-time, which turns out to be an ellipse. Again, radically different notions of what constitutes mat motion. I, I shoot an arrow, for Aristotle, the natural motion was to fall, and the unnatural or violent motion was to, be, was to move straight. I shoot an arrow for Galileo Newton, the natural motion is to go straight, and the unnatural motion is to fall. You need an explanation, gravity is explanation. For Einstein, I shoot an arrow, it goes in the curve because that's the curve of the surface of space-time. There are no forces. Three different concepts that explain the same kind of motion, but from three different worldviews. Clearly, you can't cleave apart the physics, the arrow goes in a, in a parabola, and you calculate it, from the explanation, which is what do you have to explain, which is philosophy. Okay, onwards to Big Bang. Observational evidence for the expanding universe goes back to 1912. Red, the redshift of light from distant galaxies was noted to depend upon their distance from us. So you have standards to measure distance of galaxies. You look at their spectrum, and you see the further away, the more they redshifted. It took 10 years of heated battles to give the now dominant interpretation. Redshift is a function of the distance, of the speed at which they're receding from us. So like a train going by and the whistle goes lower, the Doppler effect. We typically say the universe is expanding, but what we see is redshift. A wonderful example of data being theory-laden. When I say the universe is expanding, I believe it's true, but the evidence is redshift. So the philosophical argument that you best interpret redshift as velocity-dependent distance is added to the picture, but then retold as science. Um, for a number of years, really <clears throat> 26, uh, theoretical arguments were developed to explain this fact, mainly from the Russian Friedman and the Belgian Lemaitre, who is also a priest. Um, both gave expanding models of the universe with an initial singularity and connected it to Hubble's data. 
1948, George Gamma and colleagues predicted the microwave background expand radiation that would permeate space. We're going to see that discovered in the 60s as convincing evidence for Big Bang cosmology. Now, there's a wonderful sub-story I, I could tell here. If I had a little more time, I won't, but this is where Fred Hoyle comes in. His reaction to Pope Pius XII sort of baptizing Big Bang as supporting uh, Christian belief in creation. And his being insistently an atheist and an absolute genius, he was able to con construct a competing model of the universe steady state model in which there is no beginning. It's eternal, internally inflating, and it represents for him an atheistic view of the world. So that's a great story to tell. Won't do it today, but next time. So Big Bang is discovered. It's a wonderful um, slide because it's, it tells the whole story in one slide. But is that an historical event? Is it a whole sequence of events going back to Newton with the principle of relative motion, which, which carries forward the whole thing and guides these theories in the formation? So it's, it's, it's a historical event at one point. It's also this culmination of three centuries of philosophical, theological, scientific debate as to how best to appropriate the universe through empirical data in conformity with methodological naturalism. You all know the story in the basic Big Bang model. This is pre-inflation. Basic Big Bang model, you have three models of the universe, the open three saddle, the open three flat, and the closed three sphere. Open means expands forever. It's infinite size already. Can you imagine at, the, at its instantiation at t equals zero, it's infinite in size, and it still expands forever. In the closed model, it's finite in size, much more homey, expands for another thousand billion years and recollapses into a fireball. Now that's the tie in to a great other talk on cosmology and eschatology. Uh, I take a different approach than Jack does on that, uh, but we could talk about that too sometime. I think eschatology creates challenges. I, I think Big Bang cosmology creates challenges for eschatology, but that's another talk. What is common here is that all three of these models point to a t equals zero, a beginning of time. A, in the tactical term, an absolute singularity. So now we're going to move into that other mode of conversation where you take science off the shelf, right? You listen to NOVA and you <coughs> learn about T equals zero and you say, well, what, how do I think about that as a person of faith? And is it, what does that mean theologically, spiritually? So we're moving into the normal meaning of the term theology and science. All theology does is hermeneutics, right? Science provides access to reality, we think about it. Of course, in my model so far, you've seen that it's a two-way street. That in fact, we got here after three centuries precisely because of the commitments of dozens of scientists to looking at philosophical and theological underpinnings that shaped the way they did science. Right. But right now, we're gonna switch and look at the sort of typical theological reactions to Big Bang cosmology. John Wheeler called T equals zero, the greatest paradox on the books of physics. Why is it a paradox? Well, lots of reasons, but a simple one that really gets to it is this. Here you're using physics, which of course is part of science. It therefore obeys methodological naturalism, which means every effect is the effect of a natural cause. Doesn't mean there can't be other kinds of causes, but you will look at nature that way. It's a lens you put on, right? You look through the world with rose-colored glasses, you'll see rose-colored flowers. Science explains events as a, result of as a result of natural causes. Okay, so then you go with science, you get this Big Bang model, you go back in time to a point t equals zero, all three models have it, right? That's the size going up and time going to the right. <clears throat> and what do you say about it? Well, by definition in this model, these are always model-dependent statements, but within this model, and you always work on a model, that's all you can do. Within this model, t equals zero is the effect without a cause. It's an effect, it's a state of nature, namely t equals zero, but it doesn't have a cause. So is it part of science? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm talking Big Bang cosmology. That's obviously science. And yet it points to an event which science can't get his hand around, right? Because it seems to be an uncaused event, which sounds a lot like it's a philosophical or theological definition of God or divine causality or something like that. So it's not surprising that the, that the very claim that the universe had a beginning itself is a claim which com, com, entangles the domains of scientific discourse and theological philosophical discourse. 
because you're talking about an event you attribute to nature, so it's part of science, presumably, which science can't discuss because it doesn't have a natural cause. It's an example of what David Tracy would call a limit question. The obvious limit questions are why is nature intelligible? Science presupposes intelligibility, it doesn't explain it. Why can we know nature's intelligibility could be explained by evolutionary anthropology, but not, but not that explainable. But here's an event which is in a state of affairs. It's not the characteristic of the universe, it's a state which science discovers but can't explain within this model. I'll come back to that, keep that in mind. So it's, it's really fair game to say, yeah, this is a place where people of faith, of any faith, can get into the conversation and they're not playing a God of the gaps argument. They're not explaining what science doesn't know. They're explaining what science can't know, which is a big difference. So three models. First one is, sorry. <clears throat> Theology and science are directly related. Uh, science, or in this case cosmology, is directly relevant to theology. <clears throat> T equals zero supports belief in God the creator. So, look, lumin <coughs> luminaries have taken this point of view. Pope Pius XII argued this way, uh, well-known argument, that, that in fact, this is the sort of thing <clears throat> that people who believe in creation ex nihilo would expect. If the universe really is contingent, it needn't be. One of the best ways of not needing to be is to be temporal, right? There was a time before I was born. I didn't exist. But to say that the universe didn't exist is a profound statement. All right, we all know that Jack said we're gonna die. But does the universe die? Did it get born? If science points to that, then it suggests that, in fact, that's what we mean by God as creator. Not everything we mean, obviously. The sheer fact that there's a universe is probably the best access to the meaning of God as creator. But a secondary meaning, as it was for Aquinas, would be a creator in the sense of a beginning. It would be a nested argument. You've always got the fact of existence as your best argument for the meaning of creator. But this one gives you a secondary one. Wolfhard Pannenberg, um, pro probably the most important continental Protestant theologian of the 20th century, arguably, maybe Moman too, but arguably, um, worked on this question a lot. And he also used the word support. In fact, the Pope didn't really use that, but, but Pannenberg did, that T equals zero supports creation ex nihilo. Um, Erna McMullen was known to be critical of this, says it's too, too strong a claim. The argument is if T equals zero goes off the, off the table scientifically, have you undercut your theological conversation? So you don't want to time too closely. Married today, widowed tomorrow. That was the problem for um, Friedhof Capra with his bootstrap theory. Bootstrap theory is gone. Um, but if you don't talk about science at all, you can't, I mean, if, you, if you're too concerned about the relation and you don't say anything, then you're not having a conversation. Right? So what, these folks all think it was a direct support of some kind. My colleague uh, at the Lutheran Seminary at GTU, Ted Peters, uh, ex excellent scientist, uh, theologian who really engages with biological sciences, he said that creation ex nihilo cannot be exhaustively understood as a philosophical term. It is philosophical, but it really is part of the impacting of the theological creation tradition. So he thought it was very important to be able to refer to an event of the universe as a beginning event within the ex nihilo tradition. It wasn't either or, but it was there. Now, interestingly, within the directly relevant category is our friend Fred Hoyle. As I told you already, it's a wonderful story to, to go into detail. Um, I'll be offering today at six to seven, <laughs> is Fred Hoyle's steady state cosmology, where he said, the hell with this, I mean, he was really annoyed that the Pope and others were taking apparent advantage of Big Bang cosmology, which he helped to create. And so he created an alternative cosmology, which for two decades was equal in uh, evidential warrant Steady state and Big Bang could equally uh, explain the data known between the late 40s and early 60s. So there was no data-based way to choose what you're going to work on. You had to use your philosophical instincts. But the point is, that's an example of directly relevant. So directly relevant doesn't necessarily mean support. It can mean attack. <laughs> right? That's the enemy. 
other folks said, well, they're completely irrelevant. Well, you wouldn't be surprised if Boltmann said that, you know, or Tillich, right? Because they didn't take science that seriously. Well, Boltmann did it in a kind of devastating way. But interestingly, the, the three <laughs> leading pioneers in theology and science all took this point of view. I always find this really interesting that, you know, my three mentors and distinguished scientists in their own right, you know, Peacock had 200 publications in the physical sciences. Um, John was a member of the uh, Royal Academy of Sciences. Um, they all won the Templeton Prize for Progress in Religion. They all said, it's just nothing really important here. Now, the reason why was they were all concerned with the kind of addictive category, uh, nature of this question. You know, people have spent their doctoral dissertations writing on theology and science around this one issue, T equals zero. I've spilled a lot of ink on it. And their point was, you know, in doing so, you're overlooking what's really important about this universe, the kind of thing that our biologists and theologians were talking about. What's really important about the universe, regardless of how it got going, which is interesting, but that's there, that's backwards looking, is the fact that we're in a, you know, a universe capable of the evolution of life. That's what's really interesting, the fact that we're here, the fact that, you know, dolphins are here and, and E.T. is probably here. That's what's important. So you've got to look at the universe as this masterpiece, this astor astonishing story or drama or theodrama of the evolution of stars and planets and then life on some planets, that's what we hear. And so if you spend too much time worried about T equals zero and really get into kind of intense, very technical debates around well, is it an absolute singularity? Well, because the, the singularity theorems hold, well, do they really hold? It's a huge debate. You almost have to have a PhD in physics to do it. Whereas the, the story of the universe, the saga, the myth, the legend, the whole context of the universe that we can theologize about, that's what's important. That's, why they, that's really why they said irrelevant. It wasn't because they didn't understand what we're doing, but they thought it was not worth really focusing on. Well, being the compromised person that I am, <clears throat> I support indirectly relevant, which is a code for saying science provides confirmation for theology but never proof. So my homie way of saying it is, if Big Bang is the correct theory, then T equals zero is a character witness but not an eyewitness to creation. Right? So and it, it's actually a pretty good analogy because you can't see past or before the first 300,000 years where basically the plasma cools enough for photons to no longer be absorbed, they expand out and produce the cosmic radiation, which is now 2.7 degrees Kelvin, because the universe expanded. You can't see anything before that. You can see anisotropies in that event, that's the COBE data, that tell you about why there are planets and galaxies, but you can't see before it. There's no empirical, direct empirical evidence of T equals zero. Another interesting piece is that the T equals zero isn't even empirically directly evident. The reason why you believe it is for other reasons, which again is a great story, but won't look at now. So I took up this word consonant from Ernan, who was a real mentor for me in Notre Dame, you know, it's a fantastic place, Celia's there. Um, Ernan was just a pioneer, and he's gone too now. But it was, he was a pioneer in this field. He was a very wise person, very prudent, and, and very involved, but in a very quiet way. And he had this wonderful saying that if you believe in Big Bang, if you believe in creation ex nihilo, you would expect something like uh, T equals zero would be quite likely, you wouldn't be surprised, it would be a welcome news, um, but it wouldn't be support, as Pannenberg had said, and also wouldn't be so strong an evidence for God that you needed, that Fred Hoyle was justified in going off and doing his, his thing, even though it was a very fruitful um, journey. So a lot of us, <clears throat> Ted and I, Ian picked up the term in the 90s, Mark Worthing, a nice young astron a theologian in Australia, Pick the term consonants. So it takes us to the second point about T equals zero in Big Bang cosmology. <clears throat> we heard a little about this already. <clears throat> it's called the anthropic principle. <clears throat> this starts with a scientific discovery in the 80s by Brandon Carter and others that the fundamental constants of nature, which we've heard about already today, in, in fact are fine tuned for life. Um, when I was an undergraduate of Stanford in the 60s, you know, before the, the flood, I mean, way back. You know, we just took it for granted that, you know, the universe is what it is, the laws of nature are what it is. I had a hard time memorizing the, the speed of light's value because who cares, right? Look it up in the book when you have to make a calculation. They didn't signify anything. And then just by ch complete chance, you get life on some planet with blue-green algae and whatever. It's a totally different picture now. We realize now that the physical universe is actually very extraordinary. 
in its physicality. And that extraordinariness is linked to the possibility for the evolution of life. Doesn't mean life will necessarily evolve, obviously. It means it can evolve. And that's what is so astonishing. So these, these fundamental constants then provided the basis for a debate, which is typically called the, the strong anthropic principle. What explains the fine tuning for life? So here is a slide um, with two constants, C1 and C2. And little dotted lines show the variation in the values of the constants, which are consistent with the possibility for life to evolve. And then the juxtaposition of the two gives you a little rectangle with the possibilities in two, two dimensions. And since there are five constants, it's a five-dimensional hypercube, and it's really small, because variations of one part per million um, could, would give you a universe in which life could not, in principle, evolve in the first place. So you're in a hypercube whose five sides are one part per million each. What's the best explanation? So, of course, it bifurcates into two possibilities, God or many worlds. <clears throat> so God is self-evident. I mean, coming from the Franciscan Scotus tradition, as we've heard about already today, God created the universe for life, and the incarnation is the, is the ultimate exemplification of God's uh, bestowal of God's self through grace in the world. And it saves, and it saves us, that's secondary. So it makes sense that the universe is really special because God creates the universe in a very special way so that through the processes of nature, life evolves. So the process of nature are God's gift, Life evolving is therefore God's gift. Okay. Well, a lot of people, a lot of atheists, scientists, but other people too, said, look, I don't want to give this over to uh, a theological ex explanation. How else could it be possible? Well, of course, the simplest way is you ontologize the space of possibilities. That is, on the right, on the right side, you say, um, every point in this five-dimensional space of fundamental constants is marks the instantiation of a universe. There is a universe, not a planet, a star, a galaxy. There's a universe which in, a, instantiates as its characteristic that particular set of values. And in principle, that means there's an uncountably infinite set of universes which are empirically separate. They're distinct universes. Now, in a certain sense, that explains it, right? Because, well, we're in the universe we happen to be in because it's possible for us to be here. Big deal. I mean, that's the whole point of this argument. But the question again is, is this a scientific argument? Well, sci scienti scientists put it forward. And when scientists speak, they're speaking science, right? Wrong again. Uh, it's really a philosophical, metaphysical argument because you are, technically, that's, that's true, you're stipulating the existence of something on the basis of a desire to explain what you do know exists, right? We're here. To explain our being here, you stipulate the existence of an uncountably infinite set of universes we have no, for which we have no empirical evidence. So it's a bald metaphysical argument. And of course the answer is, well, even if it's mathematically possible, God doesn't have to instantiate every universe. That's the simple argument against it. But the problem it does become pretty serious because in the 80s it was purely philosophical. It soon became... Um, part of the domain of physics with in birth of inflation cosmology. Inflationary Big Bang was produced <clears throat> to account for four or five anomalies about ordinary Big Bang along with t equals zero and fine tuning. So the, flat, the flatness problem, the equivalence of um, equal amount of matter, antimatter and so on were, were problems in Big Bang that couldn't be explained by Big Bang. Inflation says, we saw a beautiful a uh, slide of it today already, <clears throat> that in the very early universe, the Planck time, uh, the universe ex uh, exponentially expands, it inflates, then it quickly slows down and expands in the normal rate. But the effect of that is to create a universe which is hugely bigger than the one we see. The visible universe becomes one small domain on this mega inflationary universe. And if the constants of nature aren't true constants, I mean, they could vary, we don't know, we don't think they do, but it's possible, then they could vary from domain to domain. And you'd get a physical, or sorry, a cosmological model for many worlds. Now that story goes on, we don't have time for it today, but it goes on, thank you, it goes on into Lindy's eternal inflation, chaotic universe, um, 
the most recent example of this kind of thinking, of course, is the multiverse and superstring theory. And the debate goes on too, right? You'll get someone like <clears throat> um, Gerald Cleaver, wonderful young cosmologist at, at Baylor, who spends his whole life doing superstring. And he's a devout Christian. He thinks this, is, this manifests God's plenitude. Why shouldn't God create hugely vast numbers of universes? It's to God's glory, and we, we have no right to say we're the only you know, object of God's love. <clears throat> You'll get George Ellis, who is a committed Quaker, who resisted the apartheid movement in South Africa, got the Templeton Prize, who is violent against this. George will say this is the end of science because you've, you're speculating wildly, really because you still want to get away from that enigma of the fine tuning. So my point is that you get people not divided because of their faith, right? It isn't an atheist and a Muslim or something. These are all both Christians taking radically different stands on the scientificness of, multi, of multiverse, right? Because of philosophical differences as to what constitutes science. So you've got a scientific theory, or proposedly scientific theory, so it's science, being debated for philosophical reasons by people who share the theology. Right? It's just another really good example of how intricate and fascinating and wonderful this field of theology and science is. So I'll just close by saying this. Barber says, I mean, this is saying, don't get into that debate. There's another way to look at it. The anthropic principle is not a design argument. Faith in God is not based on science, though theology may be partially confirmed by science. Paul Davies, who is a, a deist, um, Freeman Dyson, um, deist, life is at home in this universe against Minot and Weinberg and Dawkins. And my own view is that quantum mechanics helps to make biological uh, life possible. So our view is saying this, this wonderful notion of fine tuning is not to be used in a debate between design or not, right, or many worlds or not is to be used to say however God created this universe through many worlds or not. It displays God's purpose. Life and all of its fecundity and beauty and tragedy and anomaly is part of this universe. And as Jack said, because of its anomaly, because it's harsh and beautiful, it, it demands some sort of eschatological vision. The answer isn't in a broken past, because there is none. The answer is in a healed future. So I would leave it with this. We are truly at home in the universe that God has created for life. And this, this has vast potential for Christian theology, Christian ethics, and Christian spirituality. Theology, philosophy, and science can be partners in creative mutual interaction. And again, in honor of this wonderful university, let me quote John Paul II. Science can purify religion from error and superstition. Religion can purify science from idolatry and false absolutes. Each can draw the other into a wider world, a world in which both can flourish. Thank you.